you are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my Foul Play February series. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today we are going to be finding out what is inside letters that was sent to this person from jail and they had no idea why. By the way, I am posting every single day this month, so if you do enjoy my content, I would love if you would come back and see me every day because I will be here and I would love to talk to you down below in the comments as well. But let's get back to the story. So I'm not really sure what this is about, but it looked very intriguing just by the title and something you guys would definitely like to hear about. It's called, A strange inmate at the St. Louis prison started sending me letters. I didn't realize why until it was too late. So I don't know about you, but I really want to hear what is in these letters. So let's just go ahead and get into it. Because if I began getting letters sent from a jail cell, I would freak out. I would probably be a little bit intrigued, but I would also be very freaked out. So let's get into it. <clears throat> it says, maybe I allowed myself to be disarmed by the fact that he came at three in the afternoon. He knocked very softly for a man of his stature, hulking as he was at six foot four with wide shoulders and big hairy knuckles. When I asked how I could help him, he reached into his coat pocket, withdrew an envelope, and held it out to me. Who wears a coat in August? I took the envelope and looked it over. Its face was stamped over several times with information for the St. Louis Correctional Facility. A letter from prison. Great. I didn't know anyone in prison. Then, I noticed a post-it paper clipped to the back of the envelope. It read simply, Please allow the courier to be present to witness the reading of this letter. I looked up at the man towering over me on the porch. Though he was large, he didn't appear threatening. If anything, his calm smile made me think he might be rather friendly. I asked if he had any clue about the contents of the letter or why his presence was necessary for reading, but the tall man shrugged and gestured toward the foyer. I nodded and invited him in. In the kitchen, we both sat across from one another. I offered him some coffee, but he silently declined. Glancing up at him one last time, I peeled the flap back and pulled out a ten-page letter, scrawn in hasty handwriting on lined yellow paper. The letter began, You don't know me. You will likely never meet me. I am on death row at the St. Louis Correctional Facility. I was locked up for the murder of my wife and children. Lionel was three. Macy was just six months old. I loved them dearly, but I did kill them. I will admit that first and foremost, I hate myself for it, and I rot in my cell, tortured by the images of their blood dripping off my knuckles. Let me tell you a story. I don't know if I want to hear this story. I looked back up at the tall man with disgust obvious on my face. His calm, soft grin didn't waver as he stared back at me. I got up to get a glass of water, then returned to the letter. The author of the letter, whose name I found out was Fitz Willard, had been incarcerated two weeks ago and began work on this letter as soon as he had access to stationery. He never explained how he got my address or why he chose to share this story with me, but the story was brutal. Fitz Willard claimed to have been cursed. My first thought was that he suffered from schizophrenia, but he explained that he had been tested for it with no results. He insisted that a demonic spirit was attached to him. The evil spirit taunted him, tortured him every waking moment. It whispered evil deeds in his ear as he lay in bed at night. It appeared in his reflection as he walked past the mirror. The demon was constantly suggesting cruelties and filling Fitz's brain with insecurities and phobias and sinister ideas. Fitz's day-to-day -day life became riddled by a running commentary on the weakness of humans, the frailty of flesh, and the freedom of bloodletting. Work meetings became haunted by the demon's screeching. The spirit hissed terrible things about every face Fitz passed on the street. The worst still, though, was that the demon's thoughts on Fitz's family. He called Fitz's wife a whore called the children ungrateful bastards. The demon told Fitz that his family didn't appreciate him, that his wife was cheating on him, that his children couldn't stand to be around him, that Fitz could never provide enough for them, that their house was a sty, that their clothes were rags, that everything Fitz had worked towards his whole life was a mediocre joke at best. 
For ten pages, Fitzwillard recounted the madness that crept into his psyche, the nightmares that woke him dozens of times at night. The demon made light bulbs flicker as Fitz walked under them. He made the bathtub run red, like blood. Flies gathered on the mirrors and the demon's suggestions became more and more furious. They became demands, threats even, until one day Fitz caved in. Caved in the skulls of his two infant children with his bare hands before strangling his wife of eight years so hard that he fractured the vertebrae in her neck before she finally asphyxiated. That's how he ended the first letter. The tall man stood and nodded to me in silence, then I led him out the front door. Needless to say, I was shaken. Why would someone decide to share such a terrible story with me? Day two. The tall man stood on my porch again at three in the afternoon, and when I answered, he handed me the second letter. As off-put as I was by the first letter, I found that I sat watching television that night. I couldn't shake the story from my head. I took the second letter and led its deliverer to the kitchen table once again. I wanted more. What word does justice to the nature of the second letter? Dark, twisted, desperate? The yellow paper was rife with drawings of forlorn figures huddled in corners and tiny bodies splayed out in pools of pencil gray. Smudges of graphite made all of the little doodles appear in shadows. The second page of the letter was one big drawing. A woman's face twisted up in suffering, her mouth hanging open and her throat packed full of maggots. Spiders wrapped up in her hair. Tears whipping down from her eyes, her hands grasped her own face, jagged nails dug into her cheeks. That second letter gave me a name to the demon. Grimdeed. Grimdeed the Tormentor. I glanced up often from the letter to the man sitting across the table from me. Did he know the terrible tale I was being told? Is that why it was so important that he was present when I read it? His gentle smile never faltered, never faded, as he looked idly around the kitchen. Fitz elaborated on his descent into madness, about the tearful call he made to 911 as he stood over the lifeless bodies of his family. He talked about the trial and how even in the courtroom Grimdeed sat behind him at the defendant's table and spoke curses about everyone present. Grimdeed demanded that Fitz try for the bailiff's gun at the conclusion of the trial, and Fitz did. This led to a brief beating. Grimdeed said that Fitz should stand at the door of his cell, screaming profanity and threatening the guards. This led to a longer beating. Grimdeed told Fitz to spit at the judge the next day at the trial, and as defeated as Fitz's poor conscience was by the demon's constant influence, he did. The letter ended with another drawing. This time of the whole courtroom, strewn with slaughtered lawyers and the judge hung above his stand. All of it was in the smeared gray of pencil lead with grimy fingerprints pressed onto yellow paper. On the third day, I was sitting on the bottom stair just inside the door, waiting for three o'clock. Right on time, the courier arrived, and without a word between us, I let him walk through the door. He set the third letter on the kitchen table and sat down. His smile was brighter today, wider than usual. I could tell by his demeanor that this must be the final letter. I peeled the envelope open and sat with a steaming coffee at my elbow. In this third letter, Fitz talked about his days in prison, how even in his incarceration, Grimdeed the Tormentor haunted him. He described how slow the death penalty process took, how he may die of old age in his prison cell long before an execution date was set. His penmanship became a barely legible scribble. His writing was frantic. He was a rat trapped in a cage, being prodded constantly by the cruel musings of Grimdeed the Tormentor. Fitz's sanity had long passed. He doodled himself smearing something on the walls of his cell with his hands. I assume feces. Fitz said he was thinking about ripping his ears off in hopes that he would deafen himself and escape Grimdeed's whispers. The yellow pages had stains on them from Fitz's tears. He apologized for that. Then, on the last page, a spark of hope. As if he had stopped and gathered himself, his handwriting once again became clean and clear. The last line read, Grim Deed has grown bored with me. Being locked up like this, I can't do much evil worthy of him. He told me how to end my curse. Well, no, the curse never ends exactly. This is why I'm writing to you. 
to pass the curse along to its next victim. But since I still have a sliver of humanity left in me, I'll at least let you know how it's done. You make someone else pick Grimdeed's curse the same way I did, by inviting him into your home three times. My heart froze. I didn't dare to breathe as I looked up from Fitz's taunting signature at the end of the letter to find the tall man staring into my eyes. His eyes were an endless black. That cruel grin was wider than ever. Light the letter on fire, Grimdeed demanded. Wow, I really liked that. That was the perfect combination, of course, for a fiction story, to, of like paranormal and true crime and keeps you guessing but you kind of know that something is wrong with the guy that's staring at her. That was really well written. I want to see who it's written by. Of course they're always linked down below to give the writers the credit. It's written by Andrew Harmon and that was just brilliant. Did you see that coming? I kind of thought that the guy in front of her was going to be Fitz and was going to, you know, murder her in the end. I know that that's morbid, but if you guys like this stuff and like it in fiction as well like I do, you'll get that, that I'm not wanting a real person to be murdered. But if it's a fictional story, I thought that that was the direction it was going to go in. I feel like I don't have to explain myself to you guys, but I feel like for new subscribers, they may think I'm crazy if I just say, you know, I, I was thinking she was going to be murdered and I'm disappointed, you know? <laughs> so you'll have to let me know down below what you think. And if you believe that a demon can actually possess a person enough to make them do horrible, horrible things and they still have their own personality as well and have both of them without being schizophrenic or do you see it as just being schizophrenic? Although in this story they said he was being tested for it and it was negative. Although do all the tests come back completely accurate? I don't know. I don't know much about those kind of tests. I think that it's an interesting topic that it could have just been a demon possessing him and making him do these things because all of that stuff about like transferring it over, letting a demon into your home three times makes them possess you. That is so very accurate into how they are said to get into your home and to possess you and that it can be transferred from person to person and if this demon did want something horribly done to people and in the world, of course someone in jail wouldn't be able to do that so it could be possible that they just moved on but the way that it was done is just so evil. Can you imagine this girl just wanted to read letters and you can say, oh, well, she did it to herself because it was about a murder and she was still interested in it. But I mean, I don't think any of us would say that because we were interested in stuff like this, but there are people that are interested in the darker and just knowing how people's brains work and are interested, curious people anyway. So I don't think that makes her a bad person whatsoever, but I don't know, do you think this could have been a true story or was a true story? And by the way, now that I'm saying this, I don't know if it was ever even said that it was a girl. I, I'm not going to base a gender off of a story. This person is now being possessed. So let's hope it wasn't true and hope it does. it's not like a constant, you know, moving from person to person because that's just terrifying. And uh, I'm gonna pretend to not even have the thought that I just had that I read it and I read it to you guys, but I, I guarantee you, it's not gonna happen to us. We're just gonna manifest that. It's not, we're banishing all the demons. No demons allowed here, okay? <laughs> and by the way, I wear this sweater a lot and that's just because I really like the sweater and it's really comfortable, but I swear I have other clothes. I just don't know why I ever wear them and I felt the need to tell you guys that. I don't know, I'm just feeling really chatty today, I guess, but I hope you guys are enjoying this consecutive content that I'm posting and that you like coming back and watching every day because I really enjoy posting and just talking to you guys every day. You don't know how much it means to me to read all of your comments and to see you actually engaging with me and with other subscribers and it's just the most beautiful thing in the world and you guys always leave the most thoughtful, thought-provoking comments and I can't thank you enough for that. But don't forget to thumbs up. I like to remind you guys because it does help with the algorithm and getting my video out there as well as you can share it with others if you want to help grow my channel but that is it for me today don't ever forget to speak up your voice is powerful enough and i love you to absolute pieces okay